We were talking about chapter 11 earlier. We finished up talking about right about to where we got to eviction. Now, as the landlord, I got to make sure it's inhabitable. I got to make sure that the water's running. I got to make sure that people can live there. I have to fix things. I have to make sure they have adequate heat, all of those things. But what happens is the tenant can try for a constructive um, eviction. Really what happens is the landlord decides that they want a tenant out. Their lease is holding them back. Can't get rid of them. They're not good tenants. We don't really want them. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to tweak it. We're going to turn the water pressure down in their house. Or we're going to turn off the hot water access. Or anything like that, where it's going to make the house uninhabitable. Well, this is a process of constructive eviction, where the landlord takes things into his hands by tweaking things to make this house uncomfortable to live in. So the tenant can go to the magistrate and try to get out of his lease or her lease and saying, I can't live here. He's turned off the hot water. The water pressure is down to zero. It's cold inside. All of these things that are fixable, okay, he, he's, he hasn't fixed. This is called constructive eviction, right? So they want to cancel the lease with notice and vacate due to habitability requirements. The judge will be the decide, deciding factor there. Now, while we're going to um, do that, while they're going to court, can they stop paying rent? They cannot. You, the tenant cannot stop paying rent. They have to keep paying. Now the judge, the judge may in his mind allow the make the landlord pay back some rent months, but the tenant can't stop paying. They got to keep paying. I'm the landlord now. Let's turn the tables. And my tenant hasn't, you know, hasn't more than not paid. Just made the place a mess. Tore it up. It looks like hack. Broken blinds. Windows are, are dirty. They haven't taken care of it. All right. I want them out. If I or they haven't paid, let's say they haven't paid, and they only have to miss. By the way, you only have to miss one payment for them to start eviction proceedings. You don't have to miss many. You don't have to miss many. Just one, right? So in this particular case, we got to go to the court for what's called a summary ejectment. And that summary ejectment is we got to go in front of the magistrate, right? And then they are going to decide whether I have a right to get rid of. Um, Get rid of the tenant. Now, they do not want me as the landlord to enforce that order. They will send the sheriff to enforce the order, right? Because what's going to happen if I go knock on the door and tell my tenant, who's already mad at me, to get out? You got 24 hours to get out. It puts myself in a rather dangerous situation, does it not? Now, if the sheriff comes knocking on your door, at least they're equipped to handle a dangerous situation situation and maybe they can defer that so they're going to send the the court would send a sheriff to enforce that order all right now could there be an expedited eviction if it's criminal yeah absolutely absolutely they can take them put them in handcuffs and take them away all right so it, that could happen if it's criminal but usually it's just non-payment of rent right usually it's just non-payment of rent and we're going to get the sheriff to enforce the order it's not as simple as just throwing them out can't do that. Now, let's say I go to the court and try to get that tenant out. And the judge says, don't be an idiot. Let them go. They're having problems. Give them another six months and see what happens. If they're a perfect payer for the next six months and they have not, not missed a payment, they've been excellent citizens. After During that period of time, um, during that period of time, then I... I couldn't do a retaliatory eviction. I couldn't tell them three months in advance, I'm not renewing your lease. So they're kind of in there for the extent of their lease, right? Because I couldn't take offense that they, you know, I couldn't get them out. Couldn't be mad at them. Um, would I need proof of illegal activity? Proof is, you know, if I told the judge, before I got to the judge, so I'd have to have a lawyer, obviously. Um, and then we'd talk it through. Proof of that illegal activity. Mostly, when I go to court as the landlord, it's because they didn't pay. But if I have suspicion, and then I can get my call my attorney, and then we can talk that through and see where it goes. Depends on the the validity. I mean, if we have suspicion of uh, you know some sort of uh, um, 
clearinghouse for a drug deal or a meth lab or whatever, we're going to call the cops, right? We're going to call the cops. And they have the right to get in there. So that would be the way we'd have to go there. Um, yeah, your lawyer would definitely guide you through it. All right, so we can't retaliate if we if we don't get this out. Or if a tenant says that I'm trying to constructively evict, and the judge says, all right, we're going to make them fix it, and you go back. If that's the case, what will happen is that you can't just throw them out for any simple reason. All right, They have to be, be able to live quietly, quiet enjoyment, and to be able to stay there. So a writ of possession procedure has to be followed. That means that we're going to take it over. Yeah. We're going to take it back. So be very, very heads up on that. If you own properties, you cannot just simply get somebody out. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. You got to go through it. Okay, now, a tenant's duties. I'm renting your property. Well, I got to maintain that dwelling unit. I have to keep it clean. I have to return it in the manner that I received it with normal wear and tear. Maybe there's a little dirt on the walls. You know, maybe the carpet's flattened out a little bit or whatever, but I got to remove the trash. I got to keep it clean. I have to make sure no, there's no leaks. I have to change the batteries in the fire, uh, in the uh, smoke detector, right? And I have to make sure the rent's paid. That's my job, right? I have to return this as close as I can to what it is. So with that, I'm going to keep some security money. I want, if I'm the landlord, I am going to get, I'm going to get some security money just in case you make a mess of it. So there are regulated amounts, the Tenant Security Deposit Act, and we'll, I'll give you those in a minute, regulated amounts of security deposit that we can have, depending on how long they're going to be here, how long the lease is. And there are allowable uses of security deposits. We'll be able to use these things for cleanup, some certain, uh, some other things that we're going to go. Um, we have a list of them, non-payment of rent, damages, um, uh, if they leave early, right? Uh, cost of removing their property, getting it out of there, I can use that. Court costs, I can use that. All of those things. I have a slide for that. We'll show you that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So this applies to all North Carolina landlords, whether broker or not. So even if you're renting by owner, you still have to abide by regulate how much security deposit you can have. Okay. Now, before we get to that, if a tenant moves out today, February 2nd, I have 30 days as the landlord to provide an itemized accounting of how I spent their security deposit or give it back. Okay? Now, if we're in the process of doing things and I haven't had a full accounting yet, I have to at least give them after 30 days or before 30 days a preliminary accounting of where we're going with this. And then at no time later, I have to give them a final accounting late, uh, no later than 60 days at the end of the tenancy where they can tend to get me to um, take me to court. All right. So at 30 days, I'm supposed to give them a full accounting. If we're still in the process of figuring it out, I got 60 days, but that is the last of it. But I have to give them a preliminary at 30 days. Mm -hmm. And then either give them the money back or that uh, 60 days. I believe that if um, the way I understand the law, if you don't give them that money back, whatever you're owed, whatever they're owed, they could get triple that back. I believe if they don't, if you don't hit the 60 day mark, they can get three times that back. So this is, you know, something that you want to get it back to them. That's the law, right? That's the law. Okay. So how much security deposit can I take? If I have a week-to-week -week rental, I can take two weeks' rent. Okay. If we're a month-to-month -month periodic tenancy, I can have one and a half months' rent. But if I'm on some sort of annual rental, anything longer than a month-to-month, -month, I can get two months' rent. So if it's longer than month-to-month, -month, two months' rent, right, for security. If it's just a month-to-month, -month, I can get one and a half months' rent for security. And if it's week to week, I can get two weeks maximum. That's what I can get. Now, it's still that money, their security deposit has to be held in a trust account. You can't just put it on the side or put it in your general account. It is other people's money until it's accounted for. At this point, it is still belongs to that tenant. You're just holding it. 
right? So it has to be held in a properly designated trust or escrow account in a federally insured depository or trust institution authorized to do business in North Carolina, okay? Now, we talked about this before when we talked about earnest money accounts, right? Trust accounts. So it can't be a credit union and it has to be FDIC insured. Now, other places can have bonds, all right? The owner landlord must furnish a bond in the amount of the deposit from a licensed insurance company authorized to do business in North Carolina. As a broker, you may not put up a bond. You have to use this escrow account, okay? You have to put together a security account. Broker working as a property manager for the landlord does not have the option of providing a bond. They must have a trust account for, um, for that money, for that security money. Now, they can have all their security money in one trust account, but it has to be in a trust account. And it can't be commingled with your funds or anything else like that. Security deposit. I talked about these before, right? I can use it if they don't pay the rent. I can use it if they have to fix the walls in the unit or anything else that's beyond normal wear and tear. I can use it if they don't, if they leave early. If they leave early and there's still two months left on their rental period, I can use that money to fill those two months. Okay. Um, maybe they didn't take their stuff. If you're in property management, you know that people disappear. They abandon it. They leave their stuff behind. I'm going to have to get that stuff out of there. I'm going to have to store it. I'm going to have to give it to wherever and hold it. That's going to cost money. I'm not paying for it. The security deposits pay for it. And then if by taking them to court, I have to pay for that. I can use it for that. Good. Uh, pet fees. Reasonable, non-refundable pet fees, pet fees are permitted. But if something is a service animal, they are not pets. So therefore, if somebody has a bona fide service animal, they are not pets. And let's not get into a discussion about service yeah. animals or um, emotional support animals. Fair housing is very, very liberal about emotional support animals. It could be virtually anything. But commercial businesses are um, have two types of support animals. One is a dog and one is a miniature pony. If it's not one of those two, it does not fly. All right? But Fair Housing says that people can have emotional support animals. And it's endemic in the system that it makes it very easy to get an emotional support pig or whatever, right? Duck or all of that stuff. I don't make the rules, folks, but if you try to evict somebody because they have an emotional support like a uh, uh, marmot, uh, you'll lose. Okay, we also have what's called Section 8 housing. This is public housing. They get supported and supplemented by the government, right? Um, so Section 8 public housing have additional rights, and they can only be evicted for good cause. And not paying their fair share of the rent is not good cause. So they have to be a danger to themselves or others or to the building in order for them to be evicted. But non-payment of their portion of the rent is not sufficient enough to throw them out or to evict them, I should say. Okay? So there has to be some other reason, right? Usually if it's a danger to you know other members of the, of the living unit or uh, to the property itself or to anybody else, that's reason enough. But just because they didn't pay their fair share of the rent or their share of the rent, you can't evict them for that. All right. Laws that protect these tenants in foreclosure situations. If you're how what I'm the landlord. What if they're gonna foreclose on me? What happens? Well, federal law requires the new owner of a foreclosed property to honor the lease for at least 90 days. Now, listen, ordinarily. If I purchase, if Shamara comes and purchases my house and I have a tenant in it, just as an arm's length transaction, she cannot come in and evict the tenant. She has to let the tenant run the course, whatever that lease is. So if I still had nine months remaining on a lease, she bought the property, she'd still have to honor that lease for nine months. If the bank foreclosed on my property, then they'd have to let that lease run for at least 90 days. Now, if the tenant decides to leave at any point before then, they're allowed to, okay? So the bank comes in, forecloses on the property, new owner comes in, they say, we're gonna give you a 90 day notice, you gotta leave. If in three weeks they've found another place to leave, we gotta let them out of the contract, 
okay? So they allow them to terminate early in that effect. Now, the only other time that that lease can be broken early is if the government takes it through eminent domain and they say, hey, we're coming for the property. Obviously, if we're going to knock down the house, is there a place to live? No, right? So at that point, the lease is ended immediately. And that's the only other time. So if it's foreclosed, you have to honor it for 90 days. If it's um, taken through eminent domain, it's immediately over. Now, any of you intending to do business on the shore, rental properties, what summer stuff, right? Some of you might be. Whoever lives in Wilmington and Topsail and Wrightsville Beach and all of those areas, they're going to get busy out in Nags Head, um, out on the Outer Banks. They're, they're very, very busy in the summertime. That's where they make their money. Well, we have what's called the North Carolina Vacation Rental Act, right? The Vacation Rental Act. And this regulates short-term residential rentals for under 90 days. Now, it is a, short, a vacation rental if you have a home elsewhere, a permanent home elsewhere, and you are here for less than 90 days. That's the rule, all right? That's your vacation. That's a vacation rental, all right? So where the tenant has a primary residence elsewhere. And it applies to all landlords, all right, with, with or without an agent. This is everybody. If there is a problem with that, with that vacation rental, we can go to the magistrate and get a four-hour eviction. A lot of places won't rent to kids, on, uh, to people under 25. Let's use that example. And we go to this condo that's making a complete wreck and a cre complete mess on the beachfront, and... They're, they're ruining the house. They're not letting anybody sleep. They're noisy. And there's people under 25 in that house. I can call a magistrate. We can get a four-hour expedited re, uh, eviction and have them out. Right? Yeah. Topsail has a lot of... Yeah. All along the beach front. I'm sure. All of them. Right? So they, they do have that. All right? Now, if I buy it or if I sell it, okay, the purchaser, Shamara, is going to buy my my vacation rental that I have in Thompson. She's going to buy it, but she has to honor all of the leases in that property for the next 180 days, the next six months. After six months, she doesn't have to take any new appointments, any new rentals, but the ones that are on the books for six months, for the next six months, she has to honor 180 days. Okay. So with vacation rentals, it is 180 days. And then this way, yeah, I mean, it, it stops people from getting thrown out of their family rental. People rent these things years in advance, right? It's hard to get to. I'll rent it for next year while we're here, right? As long as when you buy it, if you buy it on February 1, you got to honor the next six months worth of rentals there. You can't take it over till October or August 1. All right, so what happens to the money? Rents. If we're getting rent for a vacation rental. We cannot disperse prior to the occupancy of the property by the tenant an amount greater than 50% of the total rent. So they're going to give it to us. We're going to use it for whatever maintenance and what have you. Okay. Because usually what? You have to prepay rent. You have to prepay the rent on a vacation rental usually. Right. They charge your credit card right away. Well, we got to keep half of it in escrow and the other half we can use for our general fund, what we needed to use it for in that particular case, for vacation money, All right? Security deposits must stay in escrow and shall be applied, accounted for, or refunded within 45 days following the conclusion of the tenancy. All right? We have to give them back their money within 45 days. I'm on topsail, and I see Hurricane Florence bearing down. That looks like a problem to me. Right? Where are we going to go? Well, it's supposed to hit Myrtle Beach, so let it hit Myrtle Beach. We don't want it up here. And then the next thing you see, like 15 minutes later, oh, no, it's coming right for us. Now what? If you were, they want us to ev evacuate, where am I going to go? And how am I going to get my money back? Well, here, this is how the Rental Act causes insurance. If when you moved in or if when you took that rental, you were offered rental insurance, all right? before starting your vacation that covered the risk of that evacuation and cost no more than 8% of the rental price. So if you rented it for a hundred bucks, 8% would be $8. If you could buy insurance for $8 or less per hundred dollars, all right, and you didn't take it, 
you don't have to get, you won't get it reimbursed. The owner is not required for you to be reimbursed. Okay. If you take it, you're going to get your rental insurance. But if it was less than 8% of the rental price and you didn't take it, you don't get any money back. That's the Rental Insurance Act, right? Vacation Rental Act. So it's one of those things, if you're offered rental insurance and it seems cheap, you might want to buy it. You might want to buy it. Less than 8%. Okay. $8 per hundred. Okay. Let's close this chapter up with some application challenges here. A lease with a specific beginning and ending date that does not automatically renew would be a what? What's that called? Remember what we talked about? Mm, periodic, it would be an autom almost an automatic renewal. We would say month to month to month. Yeah, for years. You got it. All right. So this would be an estate for years. Now, it doesn't have to be a year. It could be for months, weeks, days, right? Vacation rentals. You rent, you rent for two weeks. It starts on a particular date. It ends on a particular date. That's technically an estate for years. Can they? Uh, next question. This lease is very common with retail tenants, where the tenants pay a portion of their sales revenue in addition to their monthly rent. A lot of stores and strip malls have this. This is called a percentage lease, right? A percentage lease. That you'll pay a small amount every month, and then they're going to take a percentage of your um, sales, be it net or gross. Usually it's gross net sales, right? So they're going to pay percentage lease-wise. This type of lease rents the land to the tenant, and the tenant would usually build an improvement on the property. What is that? This is what? Your ground lease, right? This is McDonald's, right? All those with um, all of those groups that use their buildings as marketing. There are a particular style of building. You know from five miles away, if you saw their sign or you saw, you didn't even see the logo, you just saw the shape of the building, you know what it's going to be. That's a ground lease. All right. Those guys are building their own building and using their building as marketing. They're particular. Leases greater than three years must be in writing as required by what? All right. Yeah. Statute of frauds. It is the statute of frauds. Anything that has to do with real estate sales and leases greater than three years must be in writing. Great. Via the statute of frauds. True or false? A tenant has given their landlord notice in writing that the city has declared their tap water unfit for drinking. After several weeks, the landlord has not taken action to correct the issue. The tenant can terminate the lease via a self-help eviction. True or false? Yeah, this is what's called a constructive eviction, right? It's not a self-help eviction. That means that the landlord really just wants them to move because it's inconvenient. So this would be um, a constructive eviction. And if they do get constructive eviction, they have to leave the property. Per the North Carolina Residential Rental Agreement Act, tenants must maintain their rented premises in a clean and safe condition. They have to maintain it, right? Clean and safe. Per the North Carolina Tenant Security Deposit Act, the landlords must do this regarding the tenant's security deposit after the leasehold has ended. What do we got to do with it? Lease has ended. What do we have to do with that security deposit? We just talked about it. We have to at least account for it, right? 30 days. If we, if we can't give it back to them because we're still figuring out the accounting, we have to do a preliminary accounting at 30 days and no later than 60 days have that accounting in, in full or give them their money back, okay? That's the way that works. Mm -hmm. That's the way that works. All right, so that takes care of tenants, landlord and tenant, landlord tenant act. My friends, it takes a certain breed of cat to do property management. So we walk a fine line as a property manager between the owner who we have to maximize res revenue for and the tenant who we want to stay and pay, you know, pay and keep the place up. A long-term tenant who's taking care of your place is a pretty good is a pretty good tenant. They're harder and harder to find, but if they'll stay for a while, that's great. I have a very good friend of mine who is re who rented a place literally 25 years uh, ago, probably 30 years ago now. He rented a place for $660 a month, a single family home on a corner lot. It was beautiful. He took care of everything. Took care of everything. He 
When they needed painted, he painted. When the grass needed cut, he cut. He was the tenant. You know what? He stayed there for 25 years for $660. Pretty good deal. But the lady who owns that property knew that that property was getting taken care of. And then ultimately, he, his family wanted a swimming pool and a bigger place, and they ended up buying a house. But he rented for 25 years, but he took care of it. He was, he was a good guy, right? So we have some things we have to deal with, right? We have some things we have to deal with. Now, a property manager needs a license. If we're doing it for compensation for somebody else, we need a license, right? Now, if we're doing our own property, we don't need a license. But if we're being compensated by somebody else, we have got to have it. So it says here, property managers for others must be an active non-provisional real estate broker. So you can't be a provisional broker. You got to finish your provisional bug, do your classes, and then get a, be a full broker. And then work under a signed property management agreement. They have to hire you via a signed property management agreement. Okay. Now, what's nice about being the property manager is that you can have non-licensees that can help you do some things. They can fill out forms. They can hand out contracts. They can't negotiate. Right, And they can't act as the person in charge. But if you're busy doing something, they can show a vacant property. Right, They can show these vacant units. They can help get um, people to fill out these documents. They can't sign. So you have a little more leeway with the property management with um, non-licensed employees than you do when if you're in sales. Sales is a little more stringent. If you're a W-2, if you work for a company, and you lease your company's, um, your company's buildings, if you're in charge of leasing and sales and everything else, and you get paid strictly on a W-2, right? You're an employee, you don't need a license, okay? That would be sort of like a for sale by owner taken to the next level, right? You're not getting paid a commission in order to do that. You're just working, that's your job. You get paid the same amount of money every week or month or whenever you get paid. So it says a W-2 corporation employee can manage the corporation's uh, property without a license, okay? Also true of housing authorities employees. As long as you're getting a W-2, you can manage those properties. W-2 employee must be paid a set salary, cannot be paid based on performance or commission without a license, okay? So you can't get a commission if you're, you know, like a 5% rental commission. You can't get that. Property managers serve with which type of authority? Remember back when we were, I don't know, what seems like months ago, we talked about the three different types of agents. You had universal agents, you had what, special agents, and then you had general agents. If you were a property manager, don't you do a lot of things for the property owner? You do them over and over and over again. You don't have to get rehired every time you do one of those things, right? So you are going to work as a general agent, all right? You have unlimited authority for one particular piece of property. You're just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. So we just talked about all of those things. Um, you're going to do the collect the rents. You're going to find new tenants. You're going to make sure that the place is uh, clean. You're going to do the maintenance or find somebody who's going to do the maintenance. You're going to figure out um, what the, the neighborhoods are, are charging for rent, what kind of comparative properties you have. All of those things are going to be part of your job. That's why you're a general agent. You're doing all of these things for them. All right. This gets a little tricky, so let's pay attention here. The primary function of a property manager, their primary function is to preserve the value of an investment property and generate income for the owner. Okay. So that's my job. My job is to preserve the value of an investment by what? making sure it's maintained, okay? Making sure we're charging the correct um, uh, the correct rent, all right? And I still have to generate income. I still have to generate income. So that's my job. But I have a responsibility here, right? And my responsibility is to realize the highest return on the property that's consistent with the owner's instructions. If my owner is looking for cash flow, I have to figure out what he, what we need to pay off, and then I have to set the rent at a level, my responsibility, to set a, a, the rent at a level at the highest we can get so that we can push some cash flow. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't, and you're going to have to have a come-to-Jesus meeting with your owner that says you're going to be priced out of the market. So you have to let them know that. The other thing 
is that um, we want to make sure that you have owners who are just saying, all right, look, let's do this on a break even. And then, because I'm looking for future future value. I bought this condo for a song. I, I, it didn't cost me anything. It's costing me very little. So let's make sure we have a renter in there. And if I'm breaking even, you know, charge as much as we can. If I'm breaking even over time, I'm looking for property values to do what? As the oh, I'm looking for property values to go up. I'll sell it down the road. So maybe I can charge a little less rent as the property manager to try to keep somebody in there all the time. Okay. So those are things I have to discuss with my um, with my owner. But you got to remember, our primary function is M and M's: maintain the unit and maximize revenue. Right? M and M's. That's our function. Okay. And our responsibility is get the highest return. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy. Thank you for watching.